Good morning. I'm Joe Morelli, and I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, in just a few minutes, you're going to uh, hear from a number of critical partners uh, as we um, make uh, today's announcement. Uh, I want to acknowledge them first before I ask them uh, to, uh, to say a few words. Uh, Congresswoman and Chair of the New Democrat Coalition, uh, Susan Del Benny from Washington's 1st Congressional District. Uh, my colleague, uh, Terry Sewell, who uh, represents Alabama's uh, 7th District. Uh, we'll be speaking. Senator uh, Chris Coons, of course, from uh, Delaware. Uh, we also have with us Mark Monroe. Mark uh, Monroe is the senior fellow uh, at the Brookings Institute and co-author of a critical report called The Case for Growth Centers, How to Spread Tech Innovation Across America. And uh, last but certainly not least, Simon Johnson, who's an economist at MIT and co-author of Jumpstarting America, How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. And I do uh, want to acknowledge, I know my uh, colleagues in, uh, in the Congress all have uh, multiple things to do, so they're going to be speaking, and then I suspect, although they're welcome to join us, I know they have other things to do. But I am incredibly thankful for their continued partnership to find creative ways of revitalizing our regional and national economies as we emerge from this global health crisis. Uh, the pandemic has profoundly impacted our economy and our workforce, but with our national and regional vaccine distribution well underway, uh, we now believe we should focus toward our next big hurdle, which is reigniting our economic recovery. It's been proven that innovation directly leads to sustained economic growth, something our nation needs now more than ever. In fact, uh, our percent of G GDP spending in research and development is at its lowest level since the late 1950s. American investment in research is currently low and it needs to be high because our peer adversaries and other countries that we compete with are investing much, much more. That's why my colleagues and I have introduced the Innovation Centers Acceleration Act. We all believe that investments in innovation not only offers a path out of the crisis, but can ensure we emerge stronger than ever before. In fact, President Biden and his administration believe this as well, outlining a similar proposal as part of the American Jobs Plan introduced earlier this month. So to give a quick overview, our legislation will launch a national competition to create high-tech innovation hubs across America. It will create nine innovation center designations in which the federal government will invest $80 billion over the next nine years. Municipalities and communities would present plans for how they will devote resources to the sector uh, that is their innovation specialty, prioritizing plans that foster racial equity and inclusive growth for all. This will ensure economic opportunity that is currently consolidated only in a few hubs. In fact, five metropolitan communities attract 90% of uh, venture capital dollars across the country, whereas places like my hometown of Rochester, New York, which has enormous research and, and um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, is largely untapped because it doesn't attract investment uh, from the private sector. So not only will this enhance our ability to com be competitive globally, but it will also strengthen our economy and create jobs at a pivotal moment in our nation's history. And the legislation has received growing support from numerous organizations because they know now is the time to take this kind of bold action, including, and I'm very, very grateful for the New Democrat Coalition, the organization that has brought us all together here today. And with real partners in the Senate, like Senator Coons and Senator Durbin and the Biden administration, and with the strong support of groups like the New Democrat Coalition, now is the time to realize our potential and make this legislation a reality. I'm grateful to the president for recognizing the value of investment in innovation and by signaling his openness to policy similar to the Innovation Centers Acceleration Act. And I know that we all hope to find a way to work with the administration to get this bill passed. So when we invest in our communities and the American public, we invest in the future of our nation. And I believe that's what we need to fully recover from this crisis. But you don't have to take my word for it. My colleagues are here to, uh, to give testimony to it as well. And I'm really delighted to uh, introduce, and I know she's on a tight schedule, but I'm very, very grateful to Susan Del Benny, who's not only a great representative of Washington's first district, but is also a great leader as chair of the New Democrat Coalition. And with that, let me uh, turn it to my colleague, Susan Del Benny. Thanks, Joe. Um, the New Democrat Coalition is a group of 94 members in the House of Representatives, and we're committed to creating widely shared economic growth, opportunity, jobs, and innovation all across the country. And we really are the center of gravity in the house. And our focus always has been on getting things done. So as the chair of the new Dems and a former tech entrepreneur and executive myself, I know that in order to build back better, we need to position the US as the global leader on cutting edge technology with really a 
a space race era investment in R&D and a diverse regional reach. So that's why the coalition has endorsed the Innovation Centers Acceleration Act with my friends and fellow New Dems, Joe Morelli and Terry Sewell. And of course, our friend on the other side of the dome, um, Senator Chris Coons. My constituents, our constituents know that you can live anywhere and have great ideas. So that's why it's so important that we unlock our nation's full potential and really leverage the talent and ingenuity of our researchers, scientists, innovators, and workers in more places. I share Representative Morelli's excitement that the President's American Jobs Plan includes funding to spur new regional innovation hubs outside of the existing high growth centers. And I look forward to working with the administration um, to advance this and all of our other shared priorities. So very honored to be with you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Susan, so much again for being here, but for your leadership of the New Democrats and all the incredible work you do. Let me uh, now turn it over to a crucial voice for economic growth and racial equity uh, in the Congress and in the country, uh, someone I'm uh, so delighted to uh, co-sponsor this legislation with my uh, dear friend, Terry Sewell. Thanks, Joe. Um, as you indicated early on, I'm uh, Congresswoman Terry Sewell and I represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District. It is such a pleasure to be a part of this press uh, conference with uh, our colleague Susan Del Bene and fellow New Dem, as well as uh, Senator Coons, and of course, your steadfast leadership, Joe, on this issue. It's an honor for me to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 476, uh, the Innovation Centers Acceleration Act. So many of our communities have struggled during this COVID-19 pandemic. We know that we have a long road in front of us to recover from the, from the health and uh, economic impact of this pandemic. What we need is bold action to ensure that we have a swift and equitable economic recovery. The Innovation Centers Acceleration Act will provide an in innovation surge that is desperately needed to establish the United States as a global leader in industries that will shape the 21st century. As we rebuild our economy, we must tap into the innovation spirit across this nation, like in my current city of Birmingham, Alabama, the largest city in the state of Alabama, where we have a growing manufacturing and biotech sector, and we're poised if innovation, uh, with innovation ideas, to be able to be a U.S. leader in the global competitiveness. What we need is an infusion of capital, but we also need to be recognized uh, as one of those uh, regional hubs. We all know that America has underinvested in innovation for decades, but we could reverse this trend and ensure a more equitable recovery by establishing new innovation centers to leverage federal funding, attract new businesses, and promote workforce development. So many of our metropolitan areas can thrive if given the opportunity. That's exactly what this bill will do. It will actually harness the innovative spirit of all Americans. We are bursting at the seams in Birmingham and in Selma and in Montgomery with great ideas. What we need is an opportunity to foster them and to promote growth. I'm thrilled to see that the Biden administration includes a similar pro uh, proposal to the Innovation Centers Accel Acceleration Act in their jobs uh, plan. And we look forward to being able to unleash the innovative forces around this country and promote a more equitable recovery for all. Again, thank you so much, Joe, for uh, allowing me to speak today. I am thrilled that we have a great partner in the Senate with Senator Coons, and I look forward to continuing our partnership and work with New Dems and with our colleagues across the aisle, as well as in the other chamber, in order to get this legislation passed. Great. Terry, thank you so much. And I, again, uh, know that uh, my colleagues have other places to go, so I don't want to hold you up here. Obviously, we'd be delighted for you to stay, but I, I do know you have other commitments. And uh, with that, let me uh, ask uh, Senator Coons to, uh, to say a few words. He has been steadfast in his leadership in the Senate uh, on this issue. I know he's committed to this. Um, I also know he comes from a state where uh, the occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is, so I know he's pushing on the administration to do that. We're, we're delighted that just happens to be that way, but we're, we're grateful. And Senator, I watched you on uh, national programs like Meet the Press and, uh, uh, and uh, Face the Nation, and I'll get to work with you, and I'm very, very grateful for your leadership. I'll uh, turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Congressman Morelli, and uh, thanks to uh, Terry and Susan, to Congresswoman Sewell and uh, Congresswoman Del Bene. Uh, Congresswoman Del Bene's leadership of the New Dem Caucus is uh, particularly important in this moment because of your caucus's bold agenda and focus on economic recovery. 
um, we have something in common in that uh, all of us have worked in the private sector at some point in our careers and see the private sector as a critical part of our national economic recovery and of how we can spur innovation that will spread prosperity and opportunity um, to places throughout our country that have sometimes been overlooked in recent decades. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Simon Johnson and Mark Moreau today, um, those who've done the deep research and advocacy on innovation centers as a driver of economic growth and opportunity. The bill that we're talking about this morning is good policy and is well rooted in their research and their work. Um, as was referenced by uh, Congressman uh, Morelli in his uh, opening remarks, a simple pair of statistics help focus us on why this is urgent. Last year, China exceeded the United States in total investments in R&D for the first time. And second, um, there's just a handful of communities around our country, Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Southernmost California Research Triangle, North Carolina, that account for 90% of all investment and of all innovation growth uh, over the last decade in the United States. Um, we all come from communities that have great potential, that are both livable cities and have remarkable concentrations um, of advanced degrees, of scientific research, of entrepreneurial potential. From Rochester, New York, uh, where my brother, by the way, went to RIT, huh? um, to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, to my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware. If we are going to compete effectively with China in the race to innovate the technologies of the 21st century, we have to commit ourselves as a whole country, not just these few um, concentrated cities on the coasts. Um, we've got the ability through this bill uh, to incentivize and inspire a race by livable secondary cities with great state universities, with great opportunities to be a part of this promise. Uh, my home community, which is known as part of the Delaware Valley, or others might say greater Philadelphia, um, actually has colleges that award more professional degrees than any other metropolitan area in the country, yet it lags well behind its competitors like Boston or Silicon Valley, San Francisco area in terms of access to entrepreneurial capital and investment in innovation. In Delaware, we have a long and deep tradition of manufacturing and industry of innovation um, and investment in places like my hometown of Wilmington will grow innovation jobs that'll make our country more competitive, um, more stable, more secure, and more prosperous. So this is a bill that I think is going to inspire some healthy competition, just as the launch of Sputnik a generation ago inspired Congress to come together and act to invest in a um, remarkable, um, transformative level of investment in education and research and innovation in the United States. So too, this moment should be um, the challenge that brings us to revitalize our democracy, to reinvest in innovation and competitiveness, and to demonstrate to ourselves and the world that the United States can outcompete anyone. Thank you, and thanks for a chance to join you today, Joe. Thank you, Senator, so much for your leadership and for your forceful uh, advocacy on this important issue. We're looking forward to working with you. So I uh, learned a long time ago in politics not to have pride of authorship about proposals, but the next two gentlemen that I'm going to introduce actually should have pride of authorship because uh, their groundbreaking work uh, has really led us to uh, help uh, draft the proposal that we're talking about this morning. Uh, the first that I'd like to do introduce is uh, Mark Moreau, the uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and co-authored a groundbreaking report, uh, The Case for Growth Centers, How to Spread Tech Innovation Across America. We're really delighted, uh, Mark, that you've joined us this morning and thank you for your significant contributions to this uh, important conversation discussion. Mark Morrell. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Representative, and, and all, all the representatives and, and Senator Coons, who, who's been there all along, and it's great to be here with Simon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for zooming in this morning to talk about uh, this issue. I, I'm Mark Miro, Senior Fellow at Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. That means we're the spatial people, the geography people. And I just want to describe really quickly the problem of regional innovation and why it matters. I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, but uh, so you, know, you may have heard, you know, you've heard a little about our research at Brookings uh, and, and ITIF with Rob uh, Atkinson there. Um, we documented the worrisome divergence of uh, cities on innovation employment that's not only accelerated in the last decade, but become truly extreme. It, we used to be becoming closer to each other uh, as 
cities and economies. For a, quite a long time, we've been, get, we've been pulling away and it, it accelerated in the last decade. Uh, looking at 13 innovation industries, high R&D, high STEM uh, industries, my team found that, to have, uh, that a very few metro areas have hugely outstripped the innovation industry growth of all other places. Most notably, just top five top metros, Boston, San Francisco, San Jose, Seattle, San Diego, accounted for 90% of innovation sector employment growth during two, the years 2005 to 2017. By contrast, 90% of the nation's metro areas, 343 of them, went sideways or lost share, and 200 metros actually lost absolute numbers of these uh, innovation industries that in fact pay well, have, have actually quite inclusive uh, job profiles, great export sources. So in short, the nation's innovation sector has been concentrating in just a few places, not spreading out into new ones as we might have hoped and, and, uh, and have hoped for a long time. Powerful, high-tech, what are called agglomeration economies and dynamics are creating a winner-take-most geography in which the technology rich, often on the coast, get richer and everyone else uh, goes sideways. But here I want to talk about why this matters and why we need to do something about it. Maybe it doesn't matter. Again, as I said, all of this might be fine. The presence of clustering is widely recognized to support regional and national prosperity, right? That's a powerful dynamic, an important one. Maybe we just need more clustering. Maybe we just need two or three of these uh, huge uh, tech ecosystems. But there's increased concern among scholars, policymakers, business people, regular people, that the innovation sector's geographic polarization is now throwing off untenable economic, social, and political costs. Uh, my colleague uh, Simon will, I'm sure, touch on some of these, but I just, let me toss out three. At the economic end of the equation, excessive concentration in tech in too few places means we have too few vibrant ecosystems uh, to which, uh, through which to grow our opportunity, even as we see a troubling sorting of workers that leads to brain drain in too many places, and sometimes overly crowded uh, the tech centers. Equally concerning is the fact the nation's regional divergence is unfair in social terms. Very starkly, tens of millions of citizens, black, brown, uh, might are being seriously disadvantaged with respect to job opportunities, income possibilities, happiness and health outcomes, simply by living in one region rather than another. And then finally, there may well be political side effects of these dynamics. To be sure, there are debates about whether cultural or economic dy dynamics are uh, driving the nation's uh, political divides, but it's not crazy to think that the nation's political polarization and increased distrust of big tech has something to do with this geographic polarization. For most Americans, after all, it seems that America's elite economy is creating jobs and value far away, far away from Rochester. That's a problem, no? So the problem is serious, which is why many of us think we need to urgently push to widen the nation's innovation map if we want to rebuild prosperity. Uh, that's a way to reinvigorate the economy, compete better with China, and make things fairer. So thanks for working on this, all of you. Mark, thank you, and thanks for your leadership. I apologize that I had a copy of your report, which is on my desk. I look at it and read parts of it every day, reread parts <laughs> of it every day. And I forgot to bring it. I was going to use it as a visual. Simon didn't have the same fate because I have uh, his Sorry. book, which I uh, have a copy here in Washington, a copy in Rochester, but it gives me a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Simon Johnson, who's an economist at uh, MIT and co-author of Jumpstarting America, uh, which is uh, subtitled How Breakthrough Science Can Revive Economic Growth and the American Dream. Simon has been uh, with me on a, a number of different uh, sessions like this to talk about um, our efforts to uh, increase R&D spending and create innovation centers. Um, he's uh, uh, obviously another great thought leader along with uh, Mark and his partner, uh, uh, Jonathan Gruber, who collaborated with him on the book. So without further ado, uh, Simon Johnson. 
Uh, thanks, uh, Congressman Morelli, and and uh, uh, thanks, Mark, also for that for that really good uh, long term statement of the long term problem. This is not a new problem, and and the solutions are long overdue. But uh, let me add three points, if I may, to to what Mark and and and, uh, and uh, the congressional representatives have said so far, which are all about COVID, actually, Congressman Morelli. And I'm, I want to argue that COVID not only confirms the need for what you're saying, it actually shows us <laughs> that we can do it when we put our minds to it. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, what have we done over the past? 12 months. One of the things we've done is innovate like crazy, right, in terms of vaccines, obviously, but also therapeutics and testing. I spent the last 12 months working with people developing new diagnostic testing uh, for COVID across the, so the, the whole vertical there. And they're everywhere in the country, Congressman Morelli. There's no sense in which, you know, it's just a few places where people have good ideas. And of course, some of the ideas are very technical, very scientific, lab-based. A lot of the ideas are very operational, like how should we use this new information, these new ideas? You've got to be in the field. You've got to be close to the reality in the ground. It's a very big, diverse country. You need very big, diverse solutions. And there are creative innovative people everywhere. Plus, Congressman Morelli, uh, we've learned that you don't actually have to go to the office every day in all the lab in order to be productive. I actually don't know where anybody is. I, we didn't ask each other when we got together this morning. I have no, you said you're in DC. Who knows where I am, right? It doesn't matter. And that's a really big lesson, I think, from COVID. And a lot of the companies we work with and, and, and innovators and innovative structured universities are thinking differently about geographical location and co-location. Now, geography matters, as, as, as Mark's Mark's done a lot of work on that, it, but I think it matters in, in a different way. And if, if anybody wants to look at a concrete, specific example of how the government can really make an effective difference in this kind of situation, I commend the NIH, um, National Institutes of Health, RADx program. That's the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnost Diagnostics program uh, built by some of the leading scientists there. Now, NIH is a deep R&D place. As you know, Congressman Murray, they usually do long-term research, but because of COVID, they were pulled into dealing with much more immediate problems. And they built a program which, in summary, has, has a long-term component. It has a swing for the fences or actually beyond the fences, but it also has a lot of looking for singles, looking for a bloop, uh, bait, look for a bloop uh, hit into in, 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 you know, just outside the infield, everything, okay? They went all in and they've had amazing successes. Now, has everything worked? Of course not. If everything had worked, I think Congressman Morelli, we'd say, okay, why didn't you take more risk? It's COVID and, and, and it's about saving lives, and it's about, but it's also about getting our economy back. So this link from innovation to jobs, to lives, to health, it's there in front of us right now, Congressman, hiding in plain sight. But just to emphasize what you've said and, and, and Mark and others have said, the hubs matter. So when we work with people around the country, people with brilliant ideas, what we try to do is pull them together into virtual hubs, connect people, get them working effectively. I have to tell you, geography sometimes matters. It matters when you have more scientists. It matters when you've got more eyes on the ball. It matters when people understand the link from schools or, or what childcare needs to what local labs can provide. So geography has not become irrelevant. And we know uh, how to encourage more development, hub-based development around, around the country. We learned this from Amazon, among other people, which is run a competition. But we're not trying to get people to compete to give away tax base. No, we're trying to do what you're proposing is win-win infrastructure, local, let's call it infrastructure, which I think is a very good term for this, scientific entrepreneurial, innovative infrastructure, which has got a massive local component. As you know, it's about real estate. It's about local universities. It's about the pipeline of talent. And we're saying to people, look, bring us your best ideas. Let's have a free, fair, transparent competition. And, and you know, the, there are many places that in our book, we identified 35 states, uh, Congressman, that have this real potential. I would go higher now, actually, based on what we've seen in COVID. I'm up around 40, 42 states that should be contenders not everyone's going to win, but that's the point. And also, you know what? If you compete and you get your act together and you don't win the federal money, I bet you win the private sector investment. I bet you mobilize your business community. I bet you can transform yourself without the federal money actually showing up. And that's another lesson from that Amazon HQ2 experience, by the way. And the third point, just to conclude, is racial equity. Congressman, you, you've been very clear on this all along. It's a very powerful, important message. And Senator Coons alluded to what the country did after Sputnik which included, this Sputnik was 1957. In 1958, Congress passed bipartisan uh, support for the National Defense Education Act. People should look that up, which was exactly building the talent pipeline because, actually, remarkably parallel, people looked at the Soviet Union. They said, hey, they're going to have a lot of engineers and scientists. We don't have that same kind of pipeline. Our universities are too elite. And I think 
in retrospect, you'd say too white as well. We need to open them up. And there was a big expansion of higher education, but not only universities, it's the pipeline of talent. It's secondary education into universities. Now, I think we would also emphasize elementary. We'd emphasize community colleges. We would talk about the, the, the wide swath of jobs that can be created, Congressman, including what we've seen around um, optics in, 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 in the rebuilding of Rochester, the, the, that, that community. There's lots of jobs at many different education levels and many different uh, pay, pay grades. And these are jobs that are sticky. They do not disappear and run away to low cost countries at, at the drop of a hat. And I would say with regards to uh, competing with China, first of all, yes, we need to do it. And yes, they are absolutely are, are pulling ahead of us. Secondly, they're using our playbook, Congressman. If this is, some, some people think that China's invented something new here. On the contrary, they just studied what we did in World War II and in the 50s and 60s, and now they're beating us at our own game. I propose we go back to our own game. And, and I think it's very important for people to realize this is not a zero sum. We can win and the world can win. We're 330 million Americans, the most innovative country in the history of the world by far. The world is almost 8 billion people today. They need solutions. They need products. They need healthcare. They need vaccines. They need everything, Congressman, that, that you invent, in, that your people invent in your districts, that it's invented in Alabama, in, in Delaware, and Washington, and across the country. We just need to focus on that. And that is how we will get more good jobs for everyone. Thank you very much. Well, Simon, I, I think you need to bring up your energy level a little bit uh, in the future. But uh, no, you, you make a compelling case, uh, you and Mark. Um, you know, there's an old saying, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And this pandemic has forced us uh, to be inventive. Um, we need to make sure. And I, I think I, I couldn't agree with you more about we went through at the, at the state level when I was in the state legislature, a, a similar competition, part of a, a strategy I helped create as a state legislator and what it did, at least in the Finger Lakes in the Rochester region, it forced us to come together to focus on what are our real strengths? What are the things that we can be world-class in? Where are we gonna be top of class? Uh, and let's focus on those. And I think that will happen to your point, whether you end up being a community that wins the award or not, it still forces you to focus on what you do well. And the final point, which I, I think is so uh, well made and you made well is we need to think about the workforce we need to think about making sure young people not only have exposure to new technologies and the, the, the joy of being in an innovative uh, industry, but also that they're prepared so that they know what those requirements will be early on in their lives. So when they're devoting themselves to either the sciences or technology, engineering, that they have the requisite math, science background uh, to be able to compete. We've seen in Rochester where one of our uh, long-standing uh, areas of focus is optics imaging. We have high school, uh, community college, as well as advanced university degrees in optics, which allows people at various parts of that industry to uh, come in sometimes with only a high school education and, and, and still earn a uh, middle-class wage and, and also the opportunity to, to move up the career ladder. So anyway, thank both of you, I think, uh, not only for being here today, which is important to us, uh, but for the incredible work that you've done and you've devoted the, yourselves uh, to this and uh, now we need to get to it. So Dana, I'm going to turn it back to you. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, uh, that concludes our program here, but I just wanted to see if any, anyone has any questions. Um, I know we, uh, we've lost some of our representatives, but uh, if anyone has questions for either Congressman Morelli or uh, either of our partners, Simon or Mark, just uh, unmute yourself and you can go ahead. Give it a couple minutes. Here. You know, as often as the case, I've answered most questions before they've been asked. So <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a, a job well done. So it only, doesn't look like we have any. True. <laughs> it doesn't look like we have any questions. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We've uh, we've recorded this press conference, and we'll get a copy of that out to everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I look forward to working, continuing our work, uh, Mark and Simon and. Again, thanks for your leadership. Thanks for being here today, and we'll, we'll talk very soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.